Hello, traders. Uh, thanks for joining us today again on another uh, Convergence special event. Today is very, very special. We have uh, Jeff Snyder here with us with Alhambra Investment Partners. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, repos and the repo market. Uh, we'll cover that in a second here. I want to remind everyone that derivatives trading is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. A quick overview here. The purpose today is, um, is uh, again, to talk about the repo markets. We'll spend a moment uh, just introducing Jeff, and then we'll dive right in. Uh, Jeff's got uh, quite the slide deck on the repo market. Uh, we'll dive right in and see how uh, repurchase agreements, or repos uh, work, and how it all functions. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the players involved in the space. And then we want to finish up with uh, Jeff's view on uh, where we may be headed given the current uh, market conditions with COVID-19 and so on. Uh, Jeff will be taking questions uh, throughout the presentation. So if you have questions, please type them in in the uh, chat panel in front of you. They'll be, uh, they'll be vetted uh, and then we'll ask them as we move along. Uh, who's Jeff Snyder? He's the head of global research at Alhambra Investment Partners, uh, started out after graduating Kinesis College as an assistant portfolio manager at Atlantic Capital Management in 1994 and uh, eventually became its owner and president and chief investment officer. He has a very interesting perspective on the hidden in inner workings of the global monetary system. Also, uh, I, I the first time I heard Jeff, uh, he was on Macro Voices, which all of you know is my favorite macro podcast. Uh, he shows up and I pay attention. So I've been on many uh, runs with uh, Jeff's uh, voice in my head. Uh, he's also a frequent contributor to Seeking Alpha, another place where I've run into Jeff. I'm going to bring Jeff on here. Jeff, are you able to hear us? Are you with us? I'm with you. Thanks for joining me. I'm going to pitch the uh, the presentation over to you, and uh, let's kick off and get down to it. There's a lot to cover here today. Um, I will I will be asking you questions throughout. We'll keep an eye on the time, but uh, just to have at it, Jeff. Thanks, Maura. And You know, I want to thank you for having me on. First of all, especially on you know a Wednesday late Wednesday afternoon to talk about the repo market and the inner workings of the global monetary system. I mean, that's, that's a tall ask and, and having so many people interested in coming out to do it, I think maybe it's just a commentary on where we are as a society with everything shut down. Nobody has anything better to do. <laughs> I don't know what else to do. Or we want yeah, to know why this market rallied like crazy from September onwards. Uh, we all want, it's, it's impacting our day-to-day -day trading. So anyway, I won't interrupt you. Uh, go ahead and, uh, and, and give us the crash course here on repos. Well, yeah, let's start out with just the basics, uh, the basic interbank market, um, wholesale market. So, you know, it, I think most people are probably familiar with something called federal funds, if for nothing, if for no other reason than the Federal Reserve. That has been its main lever of monetary policy control, at least controlling expectations for decades. So people are somewhat familiar with the idea of a federal funds, an unsecured lending market. They may not know where it came from back in 1920. Uh, you know, this, whether this is an apocryphal story or not, there was a couple banks, I believe in Cleveland, going off the top of my head, where one bank was short of its reserve requirement for a day because, you know, customers in that bank, just, you know, more customers showed up to withdraw cash than they anticipated just through a regular course of business. And they got together with another bank on the other side of town or even across the street, I think is the story I heard. And they decided, you know, the bank across the street had excess reserves and they decided the way that they would clear the one bank's deficiency was by exchanging checks, nothing more than checks. The cash lender's uh, check was drawn on its reserve account, which was cleared immediately, while the cash borrower's check was drawn upon its house account, which cleared in the next day. So what was born was the, this federal funds market where its purpose was to transfer cash back and forth between deficient uh, reserve deficient uh, participants and reserve surplus participants. And that was a wholesale way for the banking system to manage its liquidity profile as it related to statutory reserve requirements. And it was nothing more than a handshake because again, in this, this initial primitive wholesale market it was essentially between two, two participants who knew each other and they knew it often knew each other well. Well, this whole federal funds market and the idea of wholesale uh, um, money 
kind of took a step back. In fact, it, it, it practically disappeared in the 1930s and the 1940s because of the Great Depression, the collapse in banking, but made a roaring comeback in the 1950s. But when it came back in the 1950s, it had changed and it transformed a bit. It was no longer strictly about banks trying to manage their reserve requirement and reserve profile. It became a mechanism for all sorts of financial players to begin funding positions. And so it became a true funding market. But there was a problem because initially it was still a handshake market. It was still you lend overnight on an unsecured basis to somebody you knew. But as the market was growing and expanding and, and, and including all these different players, there became a, you know, a desire for some way to add security because other than reputation alone, why else would you lend on an unsecured basis? And so that was the, the impetus behind what became, well, the repo market actually existed, but what turned the repo market into another wholesale market that today actually far exceeds anything that, 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 that takes place out there. Uh, we won't have a lot of time to get into the, why, why it's called a repurchase agreement or repo market, but basically it's the same structure as an unsecured, uh, unsecured interbank transaction. It's a wholesale market where instead of a handshake, you're putting up security for the cash that you're borrowing in, from another bank. And so these are financial counterparties, an interbank market where one party puts up a financial security in return for lending cash, or for borrowing cash, excuse me. And that, that gave the cash lender a degree of security that they wouldn't have to necessarily worry about the reputation or not knowing the reputation of whoever is borrowing their cash. So long as they had some security, it was a reasonable, uh, it was a reasonable way to conduct business across a, what became a very large uh, dynamic global marketplace. However, when you're when you're when you're a, a cash lender in the repo market and you're putting up and you're getting security in return financial securities in return for lending cash that creates some other factors that you have to consider and primarily the biggest one is the security itself because there's all sorts of different financial securities that can get, that can be put up for to you in to secure the cash that that that's being lent and primarily the, the, the most pristine form of collateral, the one that's best, that's most, most widely accepted on the most reasonable terms are U.S. Treasury bonds, U.S. Treasury notes, and actually U.S. Treasury bills. And the reason is because there's basically no credit risk with them. And I know people will argue with that point and say that the government has, especially lately, is doing everything it possibly can to create credit risk by you know, borrowing as much as it possibly can. But as far as the market is concerned, these, these large government uh, treasury bonds and treasury notes and especially treasury bills are essentially free of credit risk. And so they're the most pristine form of collateral. However, but because of the way the market is structured and because of what you're actually doing, you're accepting a financial security in return for cash, you have to be aware of the liquidity characteristics of the collateral you're accepting. In fact, this is the the biggest factor, this is the, you know, the primarily the, the thing that, that drives the repo market more than anything is the liquidity characteristics of the collateral that's being accepted. And so it leads to something called a haircut. What a haircut is, is as a cash lender, you have to be aware of the security you're getting in terms, in case that, uh, in case that when you lend cash to the borrower, the borrower doesn't return your cash. They default on they default on the interbank loan, even if it's an overnight thing. What you have to do in that situation to be made whole is you have to sell the collateral that's been posted to you. And if you have to sell the collateral that's been posted to you tomorrow, that's your, the collateral you're given today and you have to sell it tomorrow because the cash isn't returned to you, you have to protect yourself a little bit in case the value of that collateral moves overnight. So when the, when the market opens in the morning, the cash borrower says, I'm defaulting on the loan and you gotta dump the collateral on the market, you better hope that there's a market there that you're able to liquidate the, the collateral that you've received. Otherwise, you're gonna lose out too. So the haircut is the way that the cash lender protects itself from the movement and value of the securities that are being posted to it. So for something that's a pristine form of collateral like US Treasury bonds, bills, or notes, the haircut's not gonna be very large because we don't expect that the market for treasuries is gonna to move too much on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, that's all that we care about is, is the cash lender in the repo market we don't really care about the credit profile. We only care about the market tomorrow. Is there gonna be a predictable, liquid and efficient market the next day so that if I have to dump the collateral because the, the uh, cash borrower has defaulted, I can do so and cover everything that, everything that I need to cover so I don't lose any money. 
So even on a 2% haircut, that, what that says, it, it's, a, it's a, basically a bit of over collateralization. What that means is we ask for a little bit of extra collateral in case, you know, the market moves tomorrow, price of treasuries falls. We don't expect them to fall much, but they might fall a little bit. So if you add a 2% haircut, the cash borrower has to put up, say, you know, in our example I'm showing you here, $510 to get $500 in cash. And so if the treasuries drop by 2% tomorrow, I'm still covered because I've got enough over collateralization that I can be made whole in the event of default. That's what a haircut it is. And again, I have to stress this point, and I'll, I'll overstate it as much as I possibly can, that liquidity characteristics are what matter in the repo market. So Jeff, now let me there ask are, you a quick question here. I'm guessing the haircut is different. Oh, you just answered it. Uh, I was gonna say the, the rates can't be uh, kind of a fixed thing, right? Because we're talking about the overnight market in general here. The, the, the duration of this loan is, is a day or so, right? In most cases with these repos. That's right, and you're exactly right. And I think you know exactly where we're going with this because the haircuts are gonna be different for every asset class because again, what we care about is the liquidity profile of the collateral that's being posted. So for in my example here, if you're trying to post instead of U.S. Treasury some form of corporate junk bond or even just a corporate bond of uh, even an investment grade, the haircut's going to be a little bit higher. It's going to be adjusted based on the perceived liquidity profile of the collateral that's being added. So for you know my hypothetical stylized example here, if you're trying to use junk corporates instead of U.S. Treasuries, let's say the haircut's 7%. That means you have to come up with a lot more over collateralization to get, the, to get the, the repo transaction to take place. And again, that's because the cash lender wants to be completely protected in the event of a default. In a corporate junk market, those, those values could, could move around quite a bit, even in an overnight session. So uh, that's why the haircut will be adjusted so much higher because you're protecting yourself for what, what would the market look like tomorrow if I have a default and I have to dump the collateral, on the, I have to liquidate the collateral to get my cash back. So the haircut's going to be a reflection upon the liquidity characteristics, which are also taking taking into consideration credit characteristics, but mostly the liquidity characteristics of the collateral that's being posted. So let's go through uh, a realistic example here, and it, again, it's a stylized example, but you know, it isn't just the, it, the repo market doesn't just take place where people just show up and post collateral and, and you know money flies back and forth. There's actually a, there's a pretty sophisticated operation. And a, and a lot that goes in behind the scenes in terms of especially the collateral side. I think people focus, focus way too much on what's going on in the cash side when really the interesting stuff and really the, the, the big dangers are mostly on the collateral. And that sounds, you know, maybe that's a little bit counterintuitive because it seems like if you're posting security, that's the end of the matter because, I mean, it's a securitized or it's a secured loan. Therefore, what do we care about um, the security itself? Um, what really happens is all sorts of other things behind the scenes and off in the shadows where the collateral maybe isn't what it always seems. So let's start with the example of a hedge fund that's just a, that wants to run a portfolio of U.S. Treasuries. So it has a portfolio of just enough U.S. Treasuries to, to balance out with a haircut, but it doesn't usually go into the repo market itself because it's probably not set up to do so. So what it will do is it will contract with a dealer bank who does operate in the repo market and it will pledge its $510.20 in U.S. Treasuries to the dealer bank. Now, what the dealer bank will do is custody those treasuries and perform all sorts of custodial operations on behalf of the hedge fund. But by and large, oftentimes what happens is the dealer bank will also offer a better rate for funding these, this portfolio of securities because if the hedge fund allows the dealer bank to repledge those same securities into the repo market. So that's what ends up happening in a lot of cases, is you'll have hedge funds running portfolios of securities that are pledged to a bank who then repledges the securities, whatever they are, in our case, U.S. Treasuries, to the repo market to secure the cash that the dealer bank will then lend to the hedge fund. So already we've, got another, we've already removed the ultimate owner of the securities and the collateral one step away from the marketplace. And in fact, this repledging is a massive piece of the puzzle. Uh, just going by, and I'm showing you here, the, the last 10Q or 10K from Morgan Stanley, just one of the dealer banks. And they tell you that they had, you know, more than half a trillion, half a trillion from one bank of repledged collateral that was that was used in the repo market. That's the incredible. Point of this, it's, 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 I think it's astounding and I think it blows a lot of people's minds because again, as I said, 
you know, repo sounds really straightforward. It, all it is is a collateralized overnight interbank loan. And so th there's collateral and there's cash. And what else is there? And what you find out is that there are all of these different things that are going on where the collateral isn't necessarily what it seems. And oh, by the way, it, it takes place to these massive amounts and huge degrees. When you talk about one bank and half a trillion of collateral being repledged on behalf of other parties, you start to get the sense that, you know, maybe there's a lot of stuff going on that we, we maybe we need to pay attention about and a lot of potential, a lot of possible failure points and, and uh, bottlenecks that can form. And so as these, these treasuries are pledged from the hedge fund to the dealer bank, they're now in possession of the dealer bank who repledges them into the marketplace. We also have the possibility of something called rehypothecation. Now this is kind of a controversial subject, so I'm not gonna spend too much time on it. All a rehypothecation is, is something like double dipping. So the dealer bank is, is using those pledged treasuries on behalf of, of the hedge fund to borrow funds from the repo market to fund the hedge fund's position. What rehypothecation says is that they'll also use those treasuries to fund some of their own activities. And so they're sort of like re, uh, recreating or creating additional treasuries out of thin air. Now, again, it's, it's a controversial subject. Some people claim it doesn't happen. I tend to believe it happens more than people want to think. And it was a big problem back in 2008 and 2009. But again, it, it, you know, my point being here that the collateral side of the system has all of these different ways for these kinds of things to go on. And what we're really getting at here is that the stock of collateral that's used in the repo market is a very complex process that opens the door to all sorts of you know, functions like multiplication. So collateral can be expanded, the list can be expanded, the quantity can be expanded, and it's all based upon these financial considerations of the cash lender, dealer bank, and the ultimate users. And then it gets even weirder from here. We're just, we're just getting warmed up here. Well, let, so me, uh, say let me jump in here, Jeff, uh, just a couple of things. One of the questions that's being asked is theoretically this process is leveraging collateral, right? So this seems like a derivative of a derivative. You know, I, I think you put up Morgan Stanley, which would take the role of the dealer bank in this case, right? Morgan Stanley is very large. And that's why there's that half a trillion plus of repledged collateral. Uh, but it sounds like this, this collateral is kind of being compounded in a way. And I think you mentioned that there may be a, you know, is, is it being multiplied? I mean, is this a huge space is there a huge space given the the recollateralization if there's such a word uh that that would be a huge failure point in this system oh yeah absolutely and i think that's exactly the right way to put it there is a multiple multiplier with collateral and it sounds weird and it sounds strange and, and whoever asked the question is exactly right it sounds like a derivative of a derivative and that's exactly what we're talking about where we have collateral that acts like its own currency system it's its own fractional multiplier, for, if, for lack of a better term, and, and you know it, it only gets weirder from here. We've only got we've only scratched the surface with with pledging and repledging, and it's a it's part of the, the the fabric of the modern repo market where this is just accepted, you know. And and I, again, I didn't want to get into the history behind why it's called a repurchase agreement, but we went through decades where it wasn't really we weren't really sure who owned the assets that were being pledged and repledged. And it took, it took many Supreme Court cases to finally settle on a standardized repo contract where it says, you know, in our example, the hedge fund is the ultimate owner of the securities, even when they've been pledged to the dealer bank and the dealer bank has pledged them into the repo market, which isn't allowed this, the, the, the repo process to go. Sorry, is, isn't this, boy, this sounds a whole lot like those uh, RMBS and those kinds of things where, these subprime loans are being packaged and then sold to the sovereign fund in Norway, and then people default on their like. It seems like it's just another way to kind of take something and repackage it and make money off of it and repackage it again and re. You know, it's got that sense to it. Or am I kind of missing the point here? No, not at all. You've got the point exactly. In fact, the whole that's the whole point behind securitization in the first place was to create a repoable security. Because what we're really talking about is funding leverage. What is the cheapest form of funding? One of the things I probably should have gone over back at the beginning, from the from the cash borrower side, the reason you want to do an un, a secured loan rather than an unsecured loan is that un, a secured loan is a cheaper loan. Because if you're putting up securities, anybody knows who, who borrows using collateral, you're going to be giving a better rate because it's perceived to be 
much safer from the perspective of the cash lender. So if you're doing overnight repo, it is the absolute cheapest form of funding imaginable. And so if you're getting into you know, RMBS and subprime mortgages and even prime mortgages back during the housing bubble era, that's exactly what was going on. Everybody wanted the maximum amount of leverage possible, which meant you had to create securities and a liquid market for those securities so that would, they would become acceptable repo collateral. And that's exactly what happened. And so our example here is sort of a modern update of what actually happened in 2007 and 2008, which was a breakdown in the repo collateral side of the repo market. And okay. unfortunately, <laughs> not a lot was learned from that episode. In a lot of ways, we have the same faults, we have the same potential failure points, except we're no longer talking about you know, subprime mortgages, now we're talking about corporates, and junk corporate bonds. It's, it's really kind of the same process because, you know, Nobody really, you know, everybody thought 2007, 2008, the great financial crisis was about subprime mortgages when in real, excuse me, when in reality, it was a breakdown of the repo market. So, Jeff, when somebody defaults on this, on this, on this short term loan and it went through a dealer bank and it may have gotten repackaged one or two or three times, who's really on the hook here? Who, who gets hung? Is it the hedge fund per the Supreme Court uh, uh, case that you had discussed, or how does that work? Well, it's it it's a it all depends on the collateral because uh, you know it, it sounds re weird and it sounds unnatural to be, to put it frankly, um, but there are repo repo defaults that are absolutely regular. I mean, we're talking about hundreds of billions of repo, what are called repo fails that take place every week, every week. It's a natural part of the market where the collateral and the cash get all mixed up and screwed up so that a fail happens. And a fail happens is simply the cash lender doesn't get its cash back or the cash borrower doesn't get its securities back. And that's it's become a regular part of the marketplace. And what happens is when there's periods of a high degree of stress in the repo system, largely on the collateral side, you'll see the level of repo fails spike. In September and October 2008, for example, the level of repo fails got up into five trillion, which meant that the collateral system is effectively just shut down, which is one reason why we had such a massive worldwide panic, because there was no collateral available to, to fund all of these risk positions. And we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, because we're going to recreate that kind of a process uh, using our, our examples here. Mm -hmm. But your point stands. It, it, it really is. It's, you know, we're, we're still looking at basically the same types of failure points and the same ways in which the system can fail, the same potential for bottlenecks. Very cool. Okay, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, there are a lot of questions. I don't even know where to start with this because I mean, one of the questions <laughs> that's being asked, okay, let's look at this haircut, okay? I need 500 bucks. I need to borrow 500 bucks. So I pledge uh, either, you know, junk paper or uh, US government paper uh, when I borrow that 500 bucks for one day, let's say, just to bridge a gap because I have customers coming into the bank taking cash out, when, you, when this deal is done and now I can give you your $500 back, do you keep that haircut or do you keep a portion of it? Uh, or or is, no. you know, is that a secure – is the haircut there for security, as you said, uh, to cover the fluctuation of the paper that I'm putting up for collateral? But there's a fee underlying it, and therefore, you know, you need to do trillions of dollars of this to really make it a profitable venture for a dealer bank, or how does that work? Yeah, there's there's like three or four questions in there. And yeah. the first one, I think, that, let's let's be clear. This modern wholesale marketplace no longer has anything or really much to do with about required reserves. That was just the way it all got started. So these modern wholesale markets are actually funding mechanisms for financial players to fund their portfolio positions. So in our case, it's the, it's a hedge fund. And so what happens is because it's an overnight transaction, um, what you do is you roll over that transaction every day. So day after day after day after day. So we go through this dance where tomorrow we unwind our transaction and then redo it all over again. And so, you know, in some ways it's ridiculous, but it gives the cash lender the ability to say, no, I don't want to do this anymore. And it gives the borrower to say, you know, enough. But the point about over collateralization is really in the case where the, the, the cash borrower defaults on the cash and the cash lender wants to be completely protected against any loss because you're, whoever asked the question is exactly right. The spreads here are not massive. They're not huge. And so that's why you see Morgan Stanley with half a trillion in repledged collateral because 
on the cash side, because Morgan Stanley is also lending cash into the repo market, they have to do a, a large volume of transactions to make it economical. And so there are a lot of these considerations. Again, we're trying to do a very simplistic model so you can understand the way that the collateral uh, system works in terms of its relation to the whole thing. Okay, one more of while we're here, who has access to this market? It's uh, any kind of sophisticated financial player that runs a repo desk. So, I mean, any of the big dealer banks, some of the hedge funds do their own repos we'll get into uh, on our own. I mean, insurance companies, money market funds, money market funds are a big cash lender in the repo market. In fact, they're probably the largest cash lender. There's all sorts of these, you know, shadow bank players that, t that, that, uh, that are really responsible for how the repo market operates. And so, you know, what we're, what we're going to go through here is just, again, it's a very simple model because we're trying to tease out some of these, these concepts, these basic concepts that take place in the actual repo market. And it's, it's much more complex than I'm making out to be. Okay. So if we go on to, you know, where we left off, we had a hedge fund that was pledging treasury securities. What if we have a hedge fund that only has, that wants to invest in only junk corporates because, you know, reach for yield, they want to increase their returns, but, you know, they don't want to put up the $537 in what, we, what it would take for haircuts to go into the repo market themselves. They can essentially contact the dealer bank to transform their collateral they're posting into the best, best possible collateral, which is U.S. Treasuries. So in this situation, a dealer bank will contract with probably an insurance company or a pension fund, any of the, you know, the financial counterparties out there that have a large static pool of securities that they're not otherwise using, typically an insurance company. And they will borrow, in this case, the insurance company will lend U.S. Treasuries to the dealer bank, who will then transform the hedge funds collateral so that the Treasuries are, end up getting repledged into the repo market. So from the perspective of the repo market, it's accepting U.S. Treasuries as collateral, when in fact, the basis for the trade is the junk bonds held by the hedge fund. So the dealer bank is transforming junk collateral into pristine collateral for a fee, and it's gonna be charged a fee, and some of that fee will be paid to the insurance company for the privilege of lending these securities. But again, you can see that what we're getting at here is there are all of these different ways for the collateral side of the repo market to not be what is so simple and easy to understand. And again, that's another way that we can get into trouble with all of these possible failure points. And so a more realistic example of the market might be a hedge fund that runs repo itself. Uh, so let's, let's, for our simplicity's sake, let's say half of its junk bond positions are repo directly into the repo market. And the other half are transformed into US Treasury collateral using the dealer bank and collateral transformation under its securities lending business. And so, Let's, let, let's, let's go back a couple of weeks, back into early March, when we started to see credit spreads rise. And again, remember what I said at the beginning, all the repo market, the cash lender cares about is the liquidity characteristics of the securities being posted to them as collateral for the overnight interbank loan. And so if there's any question about the market for junk bonds or even U.S. Treasuries, as we'll see in a minute, the haircuts are going to be adjusted. So if we get into a situation where you know, corporate bonds, even, not even just junk bonds, but investment grade corporate bonds are selling off pretty violently. The, the repo market, the cash lenders might decide they need a bigger haircut on the junk bonds that are being posted. So you're a hedge fund, you've got your $537 in junk. You, you, you do the repo today and then tomorrow when you go to roll over the overnight repo loan, the cash lender on the other side says, uh-uh, I'm not doing it for a 7% haircut. I now want 12%. The reason I want 12% is because the market has moved a lot. It's in some places it's becoming illiquid. So I need to be really assured that I can sell your junk bonds onto the market in case you happen to default. And oh, by the way, the fact that you're holding a lot of junk bonds in your portfolio makes me even more nervous that you are gonna default. So as the haircuts are adjusted, it's the same thing as a margin call. But in, the case, in this case, it's a collateral call. So on half of its portfolio, the hedge fund now has to put up another 30 some dollars in collateral just to do the same $500 trade it did the day before. Wow. And if the, if the, if the hedge fund doesn't have that collateral, what does it do? Well, it might go through the, the other channel, which is through the transformation, which means 
it will increase the amount of, uh, it depends upon the dealer bank for collateral transformation, which also depends upon the insurance company being willing to lend U.S. Treasuries to the dealer bank. And usually in that situation, what happens is the haircut's applied in the transformation too, because the dealer bank isn't stupid either. And it understands the risks of what's going on in the corporate junk and junk market. So you have haircuts adjusted on the collateral transformation and securities lending side too. Hedge fund that's been owning all of these corporate bonds. And again, it wasn't even just junk bonds, but actual, you know, back in 2007 and 2008, it wasn't just the subprime mortgage bonds that, that got the haircuts adjusted. It was even the, uh, the, most, the best quality uh, prime mortgage bonds that got severe haircut adjustments too. And the reason was because again, to stress the point before, the cash lenders don't care about the credit quality of the bonds. They only care about the liquidity characteristics. And in 2007 and 2008, the, the market for mortgage bonds of all types just dried up. And so you'd see even prime mortgage bonds go bidless on, cer on certain days. And therefore, if you're a cash lender and all you care about is the ability to sell the collateral tomorrow, you don't want to you don't want to do that transaction. You don't want to do the repo transaction because you're not even sure you can sell the thing tomorrow. And so not only do you have to have haircuts adjusted, in some cases, the collateral becomes non-negotiable on any terms, which, which did happen in 2007, 2008. And there are anecdotes that happened again last month in the corporate market where a lot of places went bidless. But if you're in the position of the hedge fund where you're repoing yourself and you're going through collateral, you know, securities lending and transformation, all this weird, wonderful stuff, what do you do as, 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 as where is your recourse? What do you do if you're getting a collateral call because the haircuts are being adjusted all over the place? Well, you really don't have any. You can try to buy some US treasuries from the market or in, in lieu of being able to secure more ad additional collateral that you can post, you're gonna have to just start selling assets at whatever price you can. So that's what we end up with. That's what we saw both back in 2007 and 2008 as well as what happened over those few weeks and starting in late, uh, late February of 2020. And it got to the point where it was so bad liquidity wise and the cash lenders became so picky about their collateral, there was even bifurcation in the treasury market itself where the, the, the market itself began to, to choose and be, began to offer the most reasonable uh, repo terms only to those who had on the run treasury securities. And the difference between on the run and off the run, on the run is OTR, off the run is OFR. On the run are, are treasury securities that are the most liquid. They're the stuff that's just been auctioned off. And there's, that's where the market really takes place in treasury buying and selling. Whereas off the run are things like notes and bonds of old vintages that don't really trade all that much. And so it got so bad in, in March of 2020 that the market began to break down even in even where people were trying to use U.S. Treasuries it's as collateral, uh, usually um, in terms of trying to meet these collateral calls from this breakdown in the collateral side of the system. And that's how bad it had gotten. And so, it, you know, again, if you're the hedge fund where, you know, you can't go into the, to the repo market directly because the haircuts become too big. You can't go to the securities lending because you're also going to get a big haircut. And so, oh, by the way, the collateral that's offered through the transformation uh, channel some of that's not even going to be usable in the repo market either. So the point I'm trying to make here is that there are all of these potential failure points in terms of just how it works on the collateral side of things. Very interesting. Um, I can't keep up with the number of questions that are being asked, Jeff. I, it seems like we, we need to like almost turn this into a mini series, <laughs> but uh, you are actually hitting many of them as you're going along. Uh, and, and I'll let you, I think it's best to let you finish up in case, uh, in case you do answer a question with something that is, that you're going to cover anyway, I'd hate to jump ahead. So why don't we get through uh, the rest of what you wanted to cover and then we'll go through the questions all in one shot. Yeah, okay. that probably makes a lot of sense. That way you can just handle the questions and I'll try to be brief about the rest of the presentation here. Um, you know, the slide that I'm showing you here. Uh, my point in showing you this is that this, this collateral transformation, this rehypothecation, repledging, all of this stuff is not strictly a domestic issue. In fact, this repo market in U.S. dollars, this interbank wholesale funding mechanism, actually is a global marketplace, and most of it takes place outside the U.S. US boundary. So you have this, you have all of these global financial participants, whether they're global banks, global governments, local foreign overseas banks, all of these people that are 
that are transacting in this, this wholesale marketplace to fund these various positions and financial goals and financial aims. And it expands all over the place and it creates not just you know havoc, potential havoc in the domestic system, but for what is really a global dollar system. It's not just the, you know, the US dollar as a reserve currency is a global currency. And therefore, if repo is the primary mechanism for liquidity in that monetary system, you would expect that the, all of these things that take place in the domestic market actually take place outside of it. And just to briefly go over this, this, this example here, uh, we have the government of Argentina, which Argentina needs U.S. dollars because, again, the U.S. dollar is a global reserve currency. But Argentina is not a great credit on the U.S. dollar markets, even in you know, 2016 and 2017 when the euro bond market was exploding for all sorts of, of what would really be junk sovereign debt denominated in U.S. dollars. It was better to try to do this, this repo collateral transformation. And so what in this hypothetical example, the government of Argentina intends to raise U.S. dollars, so it goes to a local Argentinian bank and says, we want you to raise U.S. dollars on their behalf by floating a euro bond. And the, government, the Argentinian bank, which I've denoted as Bank A, will use those real, uh, euro bonds. And the euro bond is simply an offshore U.S. dollar denominated debt. So the Argentina Bank A uses the euro bond as collateral to transform it with global dealer bank B, which is the same as the hedge fund examples we used before, where the dealer bank contacts with the insurance company to borrow U.S. treasuries so that Argentina Bank A can then have U.S. treasuries to pledge in the, in the, in the global U.S. dollar repo market. So from the perspective of the repo market, all it sees is that there's U.S. treasuries being pledged when, in fact, there are these very risky Argentina euro bonds that are below the surface or behind the scenes in the shadows that are infecting and, and multiplying the collateral part of the system globally. So again, my point here is, you know, again, complicated, uh, esoteric, and also worldwide. So as these things broke down in March, uh, what we saw was a very clear um, collateral bottleneck. Uh, it was, in many ways, very much like 2007 and 2008, as you pointed out, Mord, in, the, in terms of subprime mortgages being used as collateral. As I wrote back at the time, the pattern repeated. Uh, every morning, these repo transactions are unwound, and what happened was these cash borrowers who were posting collateral found that they couldn't post their collateral on the same terms they did yesterday. Haircuts were being adjusted. They were being hit with all these kinds of collateral calls, and what that did was that that forced these, these players who were trying to fund their positions in the repo markets through indirect means, they had to find some kind of alternate, which again was usually treasury bills because all of those are on the run and therefore the most liquid, trans, uh, most liquid collateral. So every morning as the repo, yesterday's repo transactions were on, being unwound, the collateral calls were happening, you'd see the markets, pile, everybody just pile into treasury bills and those who were unable to secure treasury bills they had to fire sale their assets. And so that's what happened over, was it six days? The, the six worst days in the US stock market or, uh, back in February, March, as I've shown you here, you saw the same thing every day. You've got everybody piling into treasury bills, which was the collateral call or, or the telltale sign and indirect sign of the collateral call and liquidations across all of these markets, including stocks. And the reason is because as people are trying to fund their positions in the repo market, they're not just funding you know, corporate bonds or US treasuries as, as I was showing you in a very simple stylized example. They're funding all sorts of risky positions and risky portfolios. And so as these collateral calls, because the repo market starts to unwind and the collateral side of the repo market unwinds, they hit, they, they may force uh, leverage players to begin liquidating anything and everything they can, which is why there's such a direct link between what happened in T-bills, therefore collateral, and, and asset fire sales across all sorts of risky markets, inc including stocks. And it even got to be a point where it's so bad, as I, as I pointed out before, where the treasury market itself became bifurcated as to what was acceptable collateral, that even the people in the Federal Reserve, the Federal Open Market Committee minutes make mentions of how there was a problem in the treasury market in terms of this distinction on the run and off the run. And if the Federal Reserve figures out that there's a problem in this distinct, with this distinction, you know it must have been bad because they're always the last people to figure the stuff out. Hmm. Wow. So what we're getting at here is a very complicated esoteric system that very few people know about, very few people take much, uh, take much, uh, pay much attention to. 
but it's a vital and crucial part of the way the global financial, again, global, global US dollar financial system works and how everything is interconnected and, and runs through, not just the cash side of repo, but more importantly, all of these things on the collateral side. Really, uh, <laughs> really fascinating. It opens up a whole, a whole new thing. I have this question, uh, you know, convergent members all get this uh, live um, live news feed. Um, and what I hear every morning is the announcer saying something like, I'll tell you what he said this morning at uh, 731 here in Chicago, uh, 831 Eastern, says New York Fed accepts 23.5 of 23.5 billion bids at overnight repo operation. So that's one announcement that I hear constantly. And some, some of these numbers get pretty big, like 80 billion and so on. And then shortly thereafter, a guy comes back on. He says, New York Fed accepts all 11.1 billion in overnight repo bids backed by treasuries at a stop out rate of 0.1%. That sounds almost like a um, uh, flight pattern codes or something to me, <laughs> you know, can you, can you describe what's happening here? Why I've noticed that whatever is being uh, bid, whatever amount dollar amounts being bid, it seems to be 100% accepted by the fed currently. What, what is that all about? Well, these repo operations aren't actually repo operations. They're just called repo operations because the Fed is mimicking a repo transaction with the primary dealers. So that's that's number one. Number two, what it's doing is has nothing to do with, the, what the Fed is doing has nothing to do with the collateral side of things, which is why these repo operations ended up not doing much of any good. In fact, during the worst parts of the crisis, you saw zero bids for the Fed's repo operations because nobody had any collateral to post. So what the Fed is trying to do is be, what the Fed is, you know, the Fed is, you have to understand, way behind the monetary curve. They have a 1950s view of the monetary system. And so they're viewing, you know, the fire sale liquidations across all these markets as a cash shortage rather than a collateral shortage. And so these repo operations intend to open up a, a, a conduit for primary dealers specifically to be able to bid for bank reserves, which are a form of cash that's used in the system. But if we don't really have a shortage of cash and we, have, we instead have a shortage of collateral, what good are these repo operations? In fact, that's why uh, no matter how much the Fed offered in repo operations, it didn't really have much of an impact. You still had all these fire sales across risky assets because it doesn't actually go toward the, the real problem, which is on the collateral side rather than the cash side. Okay. I wanna run through the questions that are being asked here. And if you feel like the answer to any one of these is uh, is another hour long discussion, then we can uh, we can just punt on that and move on to the next because there's quite there are quite a few here. So I'm going to go with the most recent uh, first. Uh, the first question I have, uh, Jeff says that a dollar shortage would hit the system in the first uh, moment, but for what we have seen in gold prices, it seems that this hit already passed. What are his thoughts about it? All right, Ty, what are we talking about here? The uh, the the dollar shortage and the collateral shortage. Yeah, I think um, there's also other things to consider, including what are calendar bottlenecks, which uh, everybody knows about quarter end window dressing. But there's particular quarter end periods where it gets worse than other periods, and they happen to be the middle of March and the middle of September. There's a reason why Bear Stearns failed in the middle of March 2008. Lehman Brothers and AIG failed in the middle of September 2008. And what we just saw, the, the, the you know, global financial crisis number two hit in the middle of March 2020. Um, the reason is that dealers offer their least amount of liquidity and the least amount of balance sheet capacity to do these kinds of things like collateral transformation and securities lending around those kinds of bottlenecks. So what I think happened, what I saw up to the middle of March was that created a heightened pressure in what was already a bad situation. But once the system got past that collateral, that, uh, that calendar seasonal low point, things started to loosen up. And so that's why you've seen gold be able to skyrocket because gold is also a one of the things that uh, leverage participants in the repo market turn to as sort of a collateral of last resort. And that depresses the, the price of gold as it's being used, which is why in our or every day you saw those fire sale liquidations, gold would go down as T-bill prices went up and fire and assets were fire sale everywhere. 
So I think we've gotten past the max point of maximum pressure, which was in the middle of March. Okay. Um, can you help me understand the distinction between the global dollar shortage, but there isn't an actual shortage in liquidity, which is why the Fed's money printing is ineffective? I mean, there's a statement of opinion in that question. Uh, if you disagree with that opinion, you can just start with that. No, it's it's it, people think the Fed prints money when it doesn't. Uh, this, the, you know, this. The monetary system, this wholesale way of doing things, and in fact, the fact that it goes throughout the rest of the globe, the monetary system evolved without the Federal Reserve behind it. The Federal Reserve is nothing more than a domestic bank authority, yet everybody thinks it's, think of it as a central bank. In fact, that's what the Federal Reserve wants you to believe. If you think the Fed is printing money, that's what they want you to think because they think you'll then act in an inflationary manner. But the Fed doesn't actually print money, It'll just like it doesn't actually do repo operations. It, it has the thin veneer of money printing when all it does is create bank reserves, which are modestly, and that's probably being too charitable, modestly useful for the banking system. It's not actual money. You can't walk into a grocery store with a bank reserve. You can't possess a bank reserve. So unless the banking system does something with those bank reserves, it's not adding any liquidity to the system. And if, if banks are the reason why we have a dollar shortage to begin with, it doesn't matter how many bank reserves they possess. The dollar shortage is the banks, not the central bank. And even if you did consider that to be money printing, when you see the Fed expand its balance sheet or any central bank, including the Bank of Japan or ECB or anybody, when they're expanding their balance sheet, it's because the monetary system itself is already in a massive deficit. So even if we counted the Fed's bank reserves and money printing as money printing, they're already behind the curve because the deficit is already preceding the, what the Fed is doing. So even as the Fed expands its balance sheet, it's only because of an existing deficit in the private system where the banks operate. And I believe a large, big part of that is the lack of collateral, uh, especially uh, corporate, corporate junk nowadays. Why don't we uh, switch gears here for a little bit to, because there's just an overwhelming number of questions here. Uh, I want to make sure we wrap up by asking you this question, and that is, given what has happened with COVID-19, given the correction that has taken place, where, where do you feel we are in terms of equity prices, the indices, uh, crude oil, gold versus where we're headed? I mean, with the, with the Fed having done what it's done, offering up 2.2 trillion after the, uh, you know, the, the, the initial claims released last week uh, to buy, I think, to buy commercial paper or something, you know, wh where are we headed here, Jeff? Again, you know, like I just said, the more the Fed does, the more you should be concerned. If the Fed doesn't solve the problem, it tells you how big it is. Um, so the more the Fed has to do, the more you have to realize the, that existing dollar shortage deficit must be massive. And so nothing really has changed other than that seasonal bottleneck I talked about. We got past that, but especially the collateral side of repo, they remain. And so there's a tremendous risk moving forward of a repeat or a second wave of what would be global financial crisis number two. And in fact, that's what we saw in 2008. It wasn't actually one banking crisis or dollar shortage. There were two of them. And in between them, there was a period of calm very much like today, where everybody thought, oh, the Fed printed a bunch of money, and everything's fine, and everything's fixed. Between the time Bear Stearns failed in the summer of 2008, it really did look like things were moving in the right direction, at least, at least on the surface or outwardly. When in fact, when you looked underneath, the rot was getting more rotten. Uh, everything was going in the wrong direction. And we're kind of in the same position today, where again, nothing has changed since March, except for the seasonal pressure. So we're, I think, in the same position where, you know, the stock market is, is much more enthusiastic about the prospects of it being over, whereas you look at the bond market, euro dollar futures, other kinds of markets out there, the oil futures curve, for example, WTI, they're all saying that, no, the risk of a second wave coming uh, are really, really high. That's pretty scary. So, um, so you get a phone call from our president or whomever puts people as the chairman of the Fed. <laughs> you get a call call to say, hey, Jeff, loved this talk to you, you did with Convergent. Awesome, awesome presentation. You're running the show now. We need you to unwind this whole thing and fix the problem. What does Jeff do? <laughs> That's the first thing I do, thank 
I hang up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> move to I don't, I don't move to Guam. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't I don't want that job. No, it, it's it, look, it's it, we're just we're only scratching the surface here. We aren't even talking about the the you know there are other problems as well. We're just talking about repo and collateral. We haven't even we haven't hit derivatives and FX and you know all of those kinds of things. The real issue here is bank capacity because that's what really liquidity that's where liquidity comes from that's where quote unquote money comes from modern money is all about what banks will offer and if banks aren't willing to offer liquidity in any form whether it's repo collateral transformation cash and repo uh, fx swaps all of these kinds of things then you're screwed there's really not much you can do the federal reserve is itself powerless and so step number one is we don't even know uh, the full extent of this global dollar system, largely because it's been left to the shadows for 50 years. Nobody, monetary scholarship ended really in the 1970s and 1980s. And for 20 years, everybody thought, well, Alan Greenspan moves the federal funds rate around a quarter point here and there. That must be everything there is to know about money. When in fact, Alan Greenspan admitted throughout the 1990s, the reason they did that was because back in the 70s, they could no longer define money at all. So therefore, if you're a central bank, how do you operate monetary policy where well, you can't even define money? Well, they, they came up with what was essentially a magic trick, or as I call it, a puppet show. They moved the federal funds rate around and said, well, we'll signal to banks what we think they should be doing, and we'll let the banks sort out the details inside the monetary system. Well, that ain't going to work. I mean, 2007, 2008, we get a, a breakdown in the repo market, and there's nothing the Fed can do about it. That's why every every monetary program that they came up with in that time period, none of it worked. We had a global financial crisis. And oh, by the way, it's a global financial crisis. This is a global dollar system, not a domestic dollar system. So to get back to your question, you know, the first thing we got to do is we got to catch ourselves back up to where the monetary system was 10 years ago, let alone start figuring out where we can go from here. We need more information is what I'm trying to say. We need to we need an actual exhaustive sample and study of the way the system actually works to go into the nitty gritty details, which I didn't do in this presentation, behind all of this collateral transformation stuff, all of this weird and exotic derivatives that take place that count as money in the modern monetary system. Only then when we have a handle on how this thing really is and how big it is, can we start to figure out where the failure points are, where they really are and what to do about them. All right. Well, I guess we'll, we'll have to have you back on to, to go over that whenever that starts happening. Um, I'll I'll cut it off here. Unfortunately, I mean, this there's been a, just a, a massive interest in what you're talking about, and uh, we just can't cover it all. We've actually received not only what looks like a hundred different questions here, we received several emails with additional questions relating to. Fed repo activity and the timing of it versus the movement of stock prices and so on. And we, once we parse through these questions, we may uh, just do a, quick, a rapid fire with you or something to, to see if you can answer some of these. In either case, really appreciate having you here, Jeff, and uh, appreciate everybody's time to come in and listen to this. This is a whole new world for me, as I'm sure it is for many, many people, and uh, you've, you've helped uh, shed some light. Uh, I want to wrap up by letting everybody know what Convergent is, in case you're not familiar. Convergent is, is really targeted at traders who are looking to make a career, uh, a career uh, transition and want something that is focused. Uh, you, Convergent provides access to head traders in its uh, head trader uh, channel. Uh, we provide live market commentary throughout the day, a very quiet environment. Uh, we do also provide a pro audio news feed included in the monthly subscription. Uh, we do go through the key markets and, and uh, we, we update our market stat sheets once a month. We use these to look at the market's inclination, historical inclination, to do one thing over another so we can have a real statistical edge in trading and so on and so forth. So if you want more information, please join us at convergentrading.com. Again, you know. You can find Jeff. Jeff, I don't know if you want people to hit you up or contact you. Um, you know, Jeff uh, can be found at alhambrapartners.com. And I believe, Jeff, your Twitter, which I've tweeted a couple of times to today, is Jeff Snyder underscore A E A I P. Uh, that's on Twitter, and uh, I'm sure you don't want to receive a whole bunch of these questions and, of course, answer at your leisure 
or not. But uh, again, we want to thank you for coming on, Jeff, and uh, and and enlightening us today. Oh, thanks for having me. And you know, I I I'll try to answer as many questions as I can. I'm not on Twitter that much, but you know, maybe we can get together and put together. Even if you want to, you know, have some written questions or general themes about more more detail that we can try to provide as, as much information as we possibly can. That's uh, that's what I'm considering is to distill these into one question slides and we can just run through and have you uh, give us snippets uh, that may help people understand the system better. I think the most uh, the, the common thread among these questions is holy crap, this just looks like it's an awful, it's an awfully fragile system. And what does that mean for my retirement, my taxes, and so on and so forth? This is the the main concern, knowing how big this, this I want to call it, hidden market is, um, as you've described it today. Well, it's, for, it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's shadow money. That's, that's why I call it shadow money, because not only do, do people not know about it, most of what takes place takes place outside of outside of any kind of reporting outside of any data so it, it's truly shadow money and, I, and i'm not surprised people have, are, are kind of shocked by what actually goes on absolutely thanks for coming on jeff uh thank you FP. all for attending yeah ft before you go just want to confirm that this will be made available to everybody on the convergent trading youtube channel yes and also anybody that has registered even if you have not attended uh, you will get a an email. Uh, we don't spam anyone. You will get an email with the recording, and you can listen to it at your leisure. Thanks for coming on. Great. Thank you. Take care.